Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dreamscape. Now let's start talking about those other expansions, starting with the Will-O-Wisp, who is a friendly character, unlike Mr. Nightmare, and the Will-O-Wisp has lost all of her wisps. And you can see as part of setup, each of us put um, three wisps in our starting dreamscape. Unfortunately, they're very far away and we have to build dreams out to them and then rescue them. And when we rescue them, we can enlist the help of the Will-O-Wisp. And how does that work? Well, basically, uh, say Jen was actually making a concerted effort to try to save a wisp because, as you recall, she had this particular thing she would need to make. She has to build the water. She built the water. It's all the way out here. Jen could potentially save this wisp, although she could have extended her water out here to save that one. Now, to save a wisp, you have to build up next to them at least and then move out to stand adjacent to them. When you stand adjacent to them, they are rescued, and a bunch of stuff happens. First of all, you get to make a wish, which means you come back over here, since this is a red wisp that Jen rescued, she looks at the top wish of the red wisp list, and she now has a special power she can use for the rest of the game. Once per turn, she can say, hey, little wispy best buddy, go on ahead and activate, and Jen steals a point from every other... Um, character, every other player, who's in the same spot. Um, and as you might imagine, the red ones, because the red is all about nightmares and stuff, these are all kind of, they're light attacks. You know, transfer of points, or um, what was the other one? We didn't pay much attention to these ones. Oh, uh, yeah, well, they're, they're right here, actually. It all summarized. Uh, steal a shard, right, this is the nasty one. Steal a shard from the hand of a player. Um, who's in the same state. So move over there and just take something right out of their hands. Uh, yikes. Or, um, what was the other? Oh, uh, a shard that they have used to activate one of their powers. Uh, you know, if they haven't activated their powers yet, use a shard and block their powers so they can't activate themselves. Although, at the very least, they'll end up getting that shard later. So, if Jen had saved this little wisp, she's now got this wish. Although, instead of that, it could have been, you know, say uh, Jen had put a green wisp over there, then she would have rescued this green wisp and gotten this power, which is, once around, move a tree. And that may not sound like much, but in the regular game, you can't move trees. And often, you need multiple trees for the higher level dreams, and it's really painful to, I've got a tree on water, I need a tree on rock. You can move trees now. That's huge. But you know what? The top wish could have been this. If Jen had got had saved the little guy, then it's just a passive thing. At the end of the game, she will get one point for every grassy shard in her dream. So all of these are either special powers you can use once per turn, or they are ways to score points. But that's not all. After Jen has rescued this little wisp, and she's getting the points, or she's getting the extra power, and again, there's a bunch of extra powers in the different colors, and... Different ways to score points, too. Um, you know, not just, you know, collect all of a certain type of shard. So, um, from that point on, when your turn is up, before you actually start traveling, spending your action points, um, for every wisp you have rescued previously, so you can get up to three of them, you can actually call upon the favor of the Will-O-Wisp. You basically get Will-O-Wisp points you can spend. So you can spend one, two, or three if you've saved one, two, or three of the little babies all over the place. And you can spend these points to move the Will-O-Wisp around from location to location, just like uh, a player can. And interestingly, if the Will-O-Wisp is in the same location as Mr. Nightmare, Mr. Nightmare backs off, and suddenly that special action is active again. So you might have wanted to do this. Well, bring the will o over here and Mr. Nightmare backs off and thanks, will o -Wisp. But having will o -Wisp points to spend not only uh, lets her move around, it also lets you pick shards. Not randomly, but literally look in the bag, get whatever you want, and either replace existing things or just put new things in the spot. So if you're if you're not liking, you, you cannot find the chip that you need and you're so desperate for it, well, the Will-O-Wisp will give you exactly what you want so you can pick it up. So 
saving these little wisps, which is hard, because that means you've got to move a lot. And if you're moving a lot to save them, you're probably not moving as much into position to complete your dreams, which is the main way you score points in this game. But on the other hand, the more of them you've rescued, the more passive abilities or scoring opportunities and more control over the Will-O-Wisp you have over the course of the game, and that could certainly make up for the fact. I mean, you could go heavy into Wisp and forget about dreams. Uh, and don't forget, there's always the uh, bonus points to be had for objectives as well. So the Will-O-Wisp, um, you know, basically creates a rescue mission. And then once you have rescued these little Wisps, the Will-O-Wisp can really change things up. So that's the first expansion, the Will-O-Wisp. And now after that, let's talk about white, white as snow, which introduces a whole new set of stuff over here, plus the cutest and most adorable little snowman you're ever likely to see. Look at the little fella. He's definitely going to come in handy because as part of setup, we add these snowboards over here. They're equal to the number of players plus one. So in a two-player game, there'd be three of them. And we put additional dreamscapes out that want us to make snowy dreams, like the northern frozen lake or the roof of the dream world. And as you can see, these need a lot of white. Remember how in the main run through I was saying, ah, normally you would never put white out on the board. It has no function. You just keep them in your hand so you can spin them to move yourself around. Now you definitely want to put white out on the board because it's considered to be snow because it's a winter wonderland. And these three dreams that are on display, they are public. Anybody could go for them. If multiple players are racing for the same one, well, that's a problem. So you really have to pay attention to see if you're trying to do this, if somebody is going to beat you to it because they've got the same stuff and they just need one little quick visit to the Clockwork Golem to arrange everything and then take this for themselves. If you do complete one of these, which, you know, the top of the world requires this incredibly tall mountain with snow, snow around it, and then a road leading up to it. Uh, well, hey, not only did you get 10 points, but you flip this over. And this is a new type of card, like your regular dreams, that will let you spend shards and put them on here. But these shards work radically differently. And it comes back to the fact that these white tokens are now considered snow. In fact, snow is so important with this expansion that five more white discs are added to the draw pile. So you're seeing these white discs a lot more often. And you could just use them for movement. Um, or heck, movement of animals if you're combining this with the animal uh, faction. Or, or you know, just use them as movement so you can get to the wisps after. But if you're using these as snow, that means you can be putting them out onto the board, like I've already done in the main run-through. And now here's the interesting thing. If at any time there is something on top of the snow, because remember, when you're crafting stuff, you can put the um, uh, discs on top of other discs. And uh, the, which one is it? The... The Tower of Wandering lets you recover stuff back to your hands. The Clockwork Golem lets you move things around. Like, you know, you could say, hey, I'm going to move this rock on here, but then I'm going to move it over here to this other rock to make a mountain, let's say. Every time you remove something, whether it's another shard or a tree, if you've got the tree moving ability, or yourself or whatever, or an animal, every time something leaves, you have the option of melting that snow. And if you do, you either take that snow and put it in one of these three spots and get a little bonus action, like drawing another shard getting a or getting a move, um, or if somebody had already claimed this, then if I melt snow and put it here, hey, I get a free move, plus I get to recover two things. So you get bonuses. Melting snow out of your thing by taking stuff off it gives you bonuses. Now, if you have previously completed one of these, the melting snow goes here, and then uh, if you melt snow again, another one goes here. And anytime you want, you can spend these to get these actions, like get a fifth action in a round. That is huge. Or terraform, or, you know, so uh, you can either melt snow to put them over here or melt them onto your own private little snow fields. So that's all very cool. And that so that's a, that's a lot of really interesting stuff. Really changes the game up. Again, you can just focus on your own dreams. You try to chase after these dreams, which means you really want to start manipulating snow. But you're asking, what about the snowman? I want to know about the snowman. Well, we need more snow to handle all this stuff. That's where Frosty comes in. What happens is, during play, if at any point 
you happen to get a white shard, or now a snow shard, and put them in your hand. Either because you picked them off the main board, or because you were drawing from the bag and you found one. And remember, there's more likelihood to find them in the bag, because we've added a bunch more. Whenever you get a snow shard and put it in your hands, Frosty, that's not his name, I don't know what his name is, uh, but anyway, the, the snowman is his name, d takes notice. And if he was on somebody else's board, he comes over to visit you. Now, if he was already here, nothing happens. But if he was elsewhere, he comes to visit you. And what happens is, you go into the bag and you find a white disc. Because whenever he moves, he freezes the place. And you can put him... I could put him up here at the top of the mountain if I wanted this snow on top of a mountain. Because it's one of these things. And so now, I've got Frosty. Because I got this, basically, functionally, what happened is, I got an extra white that is already deployed. And interestingly, in the future, normally, remember, you can spend white discs to move yourself or to move animals, if you're playing with the animal. But you can also spend white discs to move Frosty. Again, his name is not Frosty. To move the snowman. And whenever you use a white disc to move yourself or anything else, it goes back in the bag. It's lost. But when you use it to move the snowman, you put it where the snowman goes. So you get to keep it. And so later on, if I find another one... Um, well, unfortunately, see... If I find another one, since he's already here, he won't move. He's already happy. But if somebody else had pulled him away, and then I get one, and he comes back, then I could use this to move him. And this is a way that you can start spreading snow faster to complete these goals. Or start spreading s snow quicker, specifically so you can melt snow, so you can get access to all these different abilities. Phew! And that is the White as Snow module. Okay, and finally, we've got the Red Raven, which is definitely the scariest of all of them, because this one embraces the Nightmare. Where in the regular game, we desperately try to avoid picking these Nightmare shards up as we move past them, and yet Mr. Nightmare is moving around and spreading them around, so sooner or later you got to pick them up. These are forced to go in, and they just make you lose points like crazy. And so what you often want to do is you want to get two of them into your dream and then have one of them in your hand. Use the Tower of Wandering so you can recall them. Then you've got three and you can do a wild card, uh, which is a very complex thing to deal with under normal circumstances. With the Red Raven, you almost embrace the Nightmare. So much so that the expansion comes with a bunch more Nightmare shards to add to the ones that already exist because you will be collecting these like crazy. Anyway, what is the situation? Well, as part of setup, everybody has, in addition to their normal starting dream that they can construct in their dreamscape, they've got a potential nightmare, like a shipwreck. And I haven't mentioned it yet, but i got to say one of my favorite things about Dreamscape is the way that with just a few simple little discs, they can atmospherically capture uh, the sense of these dreams, including, you know, I mean, the nightmare is being on this ship, out at sea, not being able to reach land as you go into a shipwreck. Um, but, you know, there's tougher ones, too, like being far from home. And here I am, trapped on an island, surrounded by a sea of nightmares. Uh, to be able to, you know, that's just so cool. The, this, uh... This shifting ground one that Jen starts with. Hell, I was just out on a green, grassy uh, lawn, and I thought I was going to step onto the road, but no! It was quicksand! I'm sinking in this nightmare. So anyway, everybody starts with a low-level nightmare. These are all two-sided cards, the, uh, the lower one and the higher one. And there's a couple things about them. One is, like any dream, they've got a special ability. And you can, like always, take a shard and put it on there, um, you know, instead of building a dreamscape, you can activate the special ability, like you saw in the main run-through. Now, the interesting thing about these special abilities, one, because they have this dark background, any shard can activate them, including nightmare shards, which is a pretty big deal. Normally, nightmare shards aren't good for anything other than clogging up. So you can activate these. And the reason you would, there's two things that happen here. One is activating this draws the attention of the Red Raven. If the Red Raven has not come to your dream, doing using this action will bring the Red Raven to you. And you have to put it on one of your shards. If the Red Raven is here, however, um, you can see it says they either come to you or they fly away. 
So, if the Red Raven's already here causing me trouble because it prevents me from being able to complete dreams and, and it's just all kinds of nastiness and clogs up my dreamscape, doing this says, oh, I can send the Red Raven away to another player. This is definitely the most interactive of all the modules. If there are multiple players, you have to choose who is going to get hit by the Red Raven. And nobody wants to get hit by the Red Raven. It's very, very bad. But, so you ask, well, why would I do this? Um, well, because if I, if I activate this, I bring the Red Raven to me, first of all. And um, whenever the Red Raven comes to somebody, you have to grab a Nightmare Shard and put it over here. And you can stack multiple Nightmare Shards here. If you still have these at the end of the game, it's like you've got them on your board and you lose three points for every single one of them. And you know, the more times the Red Raven comes to you, the more they will build up. But not only is that like negative nine points at the end of the game, as long as these are here, I make one less point every for every one of these every time I complete a nightmare. So this just sounds like a nightmare. Why would I ever activate this so that I will bring the Red Raven to me, which brings no more nightmares? That's not good, right? Well, it's because of the other action right here. After I either bring him to me or shoo him away, although these don't go away when you shoo him away, I get to activate. This little cog means I can activate any dream ability. I don't have to travel halfway around the world and spend all my action points so I can go over here so that I can manipulate my board. I can just, whenever I activate this, I could do this or this or this or this. I can do any of them. That is huge. And you will be tempted to do that. Yeah, okay, I don't need this extra stone. I'm going to do this. Yes, the Red Raven comes. But then, even though I'm all the way over here, and I don't want to move because I'll have to pick up more Nightmare stuff, but I want to activate this, boom. I get to trigger that little thing. So, now, it's not all bad. I did that. The Red Raven came. Oh, no. I can also use shards to do this, and all that does is, is send the Red Raven away. I can send him off, and he'll pester somebody else. And now that person will start uh, gathering the nightmares. And now you want to do that because if at the start of a round you are the one who is hosting the raven, the cursed raven, um, who brings all these nightmares with them, at the start of a round, if you have the raven, you have to eliminate, not put back in your hand, but put back in the bag, one of your empty shards. Just goes. The raven eats it. And that's like horrible. So um, there will be definitely reverse tug of wars where we, you know, I might have summoned him to me so that I could do whatever action I want. But then I want to, you know, I did that. But then I want to use another token to make him go away. Please go away. Um, so it's, you know, dancing with the red raven devil to get access to any bonus card you want. Start, um, you know, accruing more of these nightmares and potentially lose shards from your dream at the beginning of the round if you haven't gotten rid of them. So that's all very bad. But here's the deal, folks. Like I said, this is all just, you know, I mean, you know, this Shifting Sands or this Shipwreck, you know, if I if I get this solved, hey, it's worth seven points. Um, and once you do that, you have a choice. You flip it over and you look to see, well, I started out at a Shipwreck. Now, do I want to face the other Nightmare, Far From Home, which is a tougher one to do? It will be worth more points. I can say, you know what? No. I've already faced my fears. I'm just going to let my other fears, I think the rules, everything in the rules is very thematic. The rules say um, that they, I'll let my fears linger in the background. That means you can jettison this card. Um, it means you've given up this cool ability to activate anything in the world, but you still have this, and if anybody ever sends the raven to you, you can just send him away. Although, without the benefit of, you know, the cog. So you can do that. Um, or, you can keep it, and then you have to do the other one. You've got a big point score. And the other thing, I mean, these all need red tokens. Um, and while you're working on it, it's still the same thing. You've got access to the superpower of being able to activate anything on the board. Now, either way, when you just do the first stage or the second stage, and you score, you score it once or you score it twice, a very important thing happens. The roost get activates. As soon as somebody completes the first side of the nightmare that they are facing... Um, that player takes one of the uh, Nightmare tokens from the supply and puts it on any of these spaces on the roost. And what that means is the Raven 
now has somewhere else to go. Up until when somebody completes their nightmare, we are just trading the Raven back and forth. In a two-player game, he's literally just jumping back and forth. With a four-player game, you can choose, you'll probably send him to whoever has got the fewest of these, so you're kind of spreading out the pain and anguish. Um, but anyway, once somebody has, um, you know, solved a nightmare or, you know, faced their fears, you can, whenever you're sending the raven, instead of attacking another player, you can send the raven to the roost. And what that means is, you send them over to here, and you pick it up and do any of, since it's on this space, I can do any of these other four actions. These are all very powerful actions. Now, sooner or later, somebody is then going to, hey, I'm going to do this, then the raven's going to come back, but then they, um, they could send the raven over. Um, instead of attacking somebody else, you can do another thing. Now, the main things here are, this is the main action you want. Doing this action eliminates two of them. Uh, but doing this action eliminates one of them. So, if you built up all of these things early in the game and they were cramping your point scoring style and you don't want to lose all those points at the end, you want somebody, I mean, anybody can be doing these two actions to um, clear them out. So that's nice. But that's not all. You could do this action to say, oh, hey, you've got an extra nightmare. You could do this action to say, oh, hey, I'm going to get rid of this, but instead of putting it over there, I'm going to give it to you. So there's definitely more attacking. And then there's another one which is, oh, hey, um, I've got a, a, you know, you know, Jen did this. I've got a nightmare. I can get rid of it. And, um, you know, and, and I think yeah, it goes back in the bag at that point. So, and the interesting thing is, once one person has done it, there's one of these. Once another player faces their nightmare, there are two of them. Which means now, whenever somebody sends the raven to the roost, uh, you only have three actions available to you. So the more people activate the roost, the more tight the roost gets. Because there's all these different things that um, you have to move around and there are fewer options. So these are so early in the game when you're playing with the raven, you're probably using this because I cannot stress enough how insanely powerful it is to use any action without having to spend you know, any of these six powers without having to spend your precious four turns. Um, so you will be doing it. You will be accruing these things, knowing that sooner or later, when you face the shifting sands, and now from now on, I could start getting rid of these things over the course of the game. Or I could start giving them to my opponent, because they've still got to deal with them. Oh, another interesting thing as well. Um, so if you just did the first stage, or let's... Uh, Look at this one a little closer. If you oh, if you chose oh I did far from home or I, I did um, shipwreck and I just I tossed it. That means you stay in torment. This is the torment side, which means um, you know you, you're still collecting them if the raven comes and visits you, and you've still got this ability just to send the raven away. But you can't get the extra thing. Now instead, if you don't run away from your fears, you face the second one and you finish this one as well. Then not only do you score the ten points. But, you are no longer in torment. You are now serene. All the, you know, all the nightmares they visited are still here. But now, you've permanently got this bonus of uh, being able to do anything you want and only sending the raven away. He doesn't come to you anymore. So, if you can complete this second one, you get so souped up. Because you can do anything you want on the main board without suffering the penalties. Now, you still got to get rid of these things before the game is over. Um, and Which is why you keep trying to send him to the roost so you can clear them away over the course of the game. But, yeah, achieving serenity by doing both sides of your dream, that is ginormous. Oh, and there's one other thing I forgot to mention that's true for both sides of these. Um, this action which is just sending the raven away if he's jumping you when you're in torment, or these actions, which sends the raven away and gives you a bonus, or sends the raven away if he comes back. Obviously, you want to do this one instead of this one, but hey, maybe he comes back and you keep wanting to send him away. Because um, remember, that means you can send him back to the roost and get more bonuses over there. Um, anytime a token is used to activate any of these, you'll notice how they do not have the normal golden circle. Like a regular, if I put if you know if, if I put this here, hey, I get to draw a token, and at the end of the round, remember this will come back to my hand because these are kind of temporary storage areas. Uh, the ring means it's, you'll get it back at the end of the round. These don't have the ring, which means if I chose to do this, I don't get that shard back. The shard goes back in the bag. And the interesting thing is, 
I can activate these with a the red. So this becomes a way, if I end up traveling around the board and having to pick up Nightmare Shards that go in my hand, instead of putting them out into my dream, which I don't want to do, but sometimes I have to do, although now maybe I do want to do them to complete these Nightmares, now I can use these shards that I've collected traveling around the world to activate these, and they'll go away so I don't have to put them in my dream. And, phew, that, folks is the Red Raven, which is by far the most complex and also the uh, most in-your-face attacky one of all of the four Dreamscape mini expansion modules. And that's it, folks. You've heard the whole story. Now, if you want to hear what Jen and I thought of them, you can hit that eye in the top right corner of the screen or follow the show notes to go to Final Thoughts in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1.